All right, everyone, welcome to Land Cruiser Scotland. We are doing something different today. I am going to show you how I got TechStream working on my Windows 10 laptop. This is a bit of a different video, but I think it's necessary for the community. There's a lot of misinformation, and this is old software, and we're using like dodgy cables that we're buying off the internet, because let's face it, none of us are spending 800 pounds on a Toyota license, but there's other ways to get this working. I'm gonna show you how I got TechStream working on my modern laptop, and it is an absolute nightmare, and this video is be a bit more complicated to make because I'll show you laptop footage and phone footage. I've even got a script, which is a first for me. Now you need to know that this is an absolute pain. If it goes smoothly, you'll need a basic knowledge of computer systems. If you hit trouble, and I hit a lot of trouble, you'll basically need to be an IT professional. I hit a lot of trouble, and I am an IT professional, and I still found this difficult to do. In summary, you're going to need a laptop and a mini VCI cable, which you can get from Amazon, a J. 2534 cable and I'll have some links in below to the exact ones that I have purchased and tested from Amazon. You will need a copy of TechStream which you can either get in a in the bundle with the CD you might be fortunate enough that they include a copy of it or you'll need to download it from uh, the BitTorrent uh, source of your choosing and about the laptop if you're not able to run Windows 7 directly on the laptop, you'll need to be able to install a virtual machine. Now you can do that with open source software. I, for example, I'm using a Windows 10 laptop, but I have a Windows 7 virtual machine installed on it. Now I can simplify this greatly by telling you, don't muck around with any other versions of Windows, just install this on Windows 7 64-bit version. The basic requirements for your laptop, it needs to have enough battery that you can wander around with it, it needs to have a USB-A port on the side. That's just, you know, the, the old fashioned rectangular one. Now I'm using a program here called Oracle VirtualBox, which is a freeware, i.e. open source, doesn't cost you anything. Uh, it's a, a program that anyone can use and install on your laptop. The copy of Windows, however, uh, to be legally compliant, you must own a license key for Windows. I know that copies of Windows are available online that don't need a license or that have illegal licenses. I'm not encouraging you to do that. I'm not gonna go through all the steps of how to, how to install this virtual machine. There's plenty of other tutorials for that. But suffice it to say, once you've created a virtual machine, it's just on a wizard. You know, you can click new here and it asks you for a copy of the CD-ROM that you'll install from. That would be an ISO file, which is basically a Windows installation CD stored on a digital format called ISO. Uh, and you would install that on your laptop. Once it's on, you can just double click to open the Windows 7. Once you open it, it will start up like a normal Windows Windows 7 computer normally would, uh, it will share the memory and processor of whatever machine you have it installed on. So here we go, starting Windows 7, just like it's 2007. The first point to note about using Windows 7 is that it will be tricky to get all the Windows updates installed. You will need those Windows update updates in order to install Microsoft.NET 4.7.2. This is tricky because you need to install a lot of patches to Windows 7 before you can install .NET 4.72, but you can't use Windows Update because this is so old now that Windows automatic updates don't work. You have to install a sequence of Windows updates. However, I have been kind enough to include links in the description below of the update packages that you can download that will literally install hundreds of Windows updates to the Windows 7 installation, thus saving you from finding them all yourself. So here's my virtual machine. I don't have a lot installed on it. I've got Microsoft.NET Framework 4.8 is actually the one that's installed now, but a minimum of 4.72. And I've got this TechStream software, which is made by the Denso Corporation. And I have a driver here for my mini VCI cable. So your CD-ROM, which comes with your cable, will have the drivers for it. And you'll need to acquire TechStream in a method of your choosing uh, so that you can run it on your laptop here. So I've installed both of those things. My drivers are installed in this AutoKent folder, AutoKent MVCI multi-driver, and my TechStream is installed in this Toyota Diagnostics folder and a folder in there called TechStream. And then that binary folder has the actual executable that runs the program. It's down the bottom here somewhere, and it's just called TechStream. We don't run it using that method. There's, a, there's another shortcut to do it uh, because of um, issues of licensing. 
which I will show you in a minute. Uh, when you're using a virtual machine, you need to have the cable plugged in. It doesn't need to be plugged into the car, but I'll just plug it into the side now. Windows 10 gives me an update noise to say that it's been plugged in. I get a little red light on my cable here that shows it's got power. But then I have to pass that device to the virtual machine. Up here on the devices menu, I hit USB, and then I go to HXMVCI. So mine's come up as an HX brand, but you'll, you might have something different, but it's going to be a VCI cable. When I click that, it passes the USB, instead of going to the Windows 10 laptop, it passes it to the virtual machine instead. That makes it available for TechStream to use it. It's magic when it all works. Then you install your drivers from the CD-ROM and you install TechStream from wherever you got it. So I'll just show you on my device drivers here under USB uh, controllers, uh, I've got a USB serial converter. That's the name of the device that you'll see. The J2534 connector will come up as a serial bus controller, which in this case says it's manufactured by FTDI, whoever that is. And my driver version is actually version 2.6, uh, drivers from back in 2009. Um, so that's working well, and I hit driver's details here. And you can see there's a bunch of different files installed in the System32 folder. Are you beginning to see how this gets complicated and you might need to be an IT professional? Hopefully you're all still with me. So here's a preview of all the patches that I've had to install on this Windows 7 virtual machine. Uh, 2019 servicing stack, 2019 security update, 2020 servicing stack, 2020 security monthly roll-up, security and quality roll-ups for various .NET versions. Anyway, these, these links, I'll post them in the comments so that you can download files from there and run them directly on the PC. One more note, you might get an error message that says that there's a file missing called MVI30, sorry, let me get this right, mvci32.dll. If you get that error message, stick a copy of that file in your C drive and stick a copy in your Windows System32 folder. There it is, mvci32.dll. With a good Google search, you can find a place online where you can download that DLL. Just a single file, drag and drop it into those two folders. That'll take care of that error message. The next point is a very important one. You'll see at the bottom here, there is no internet connection on this PC. I do not have a network connected to the virtual machine. That means it's isolated from the outside world and most importantly, from the files on my network and on my laptop. If you're downloading files from the internet, particularly pirate software, illegal licenses, stuff from torrents, it is almost certainly full of chlamydia. Don't allow the virtual machine, once you've installed that software, don't allow the virtual machine to connect to the internet. So because I've got my drivers installed, You'll be able to see, now if I go to my little USB thingamajig at the bottom here, if I click that, you can see I've got an MVCI cable installed, um, and I've still got my, my red light to show that it's now connected, but it's connected to Windows 7 now instead of uh, Windows 10. This is the point where you can connect it to your car. Once you've connected it to a car, you would use this shortcut that's been created. Assuming you don't have your Toyota license yet, and you're running an unlicensed version of TechStream because you haven't paid your £800 license fee yet. You would probably be running a patched version, shall we say. Don't run the normal version, don't update TechStream, click the patch or, dare I say it, cracked version that you've been provided by your CD. In my case, I've got one here that's a shortcut on the desktop, TechStream patch 64-bit. I've deleted all the other shortcuts because I don't want to hit the wrong one. If I look at the properties of this, what it's actually doing is running the TechStream executable file that I showed you earlier with a little forward slash 395070VM1. Uh, that's somehow performing magic so that it isn't then checking for a license key and whatever. And it will run for testing purposes until you get your official license. So I'm using TechStream version 14 and I would double click there. It will initialize communication with my cable and it'll try to connect to the vehicle. It won't be able to do that because I'm not connected to the vehicle. All right, once that's loaded, I can't connect to a vehicle. So I'm going to take the cable outside and plug it into the car so that I can show you the configuration step uh, that you'll need to do. Now I'm going to pop outside. All right, now I'm outside at the car. It is dark, but underneath my uh, Behind my brake pedal here, I've got my OBD port. I'm going to plug that in. 
Don't even think that changed colour, but never mind. So now on my Windows 7 laptop, devices, I've got my USB device passed through. I'll open TechStream using the patched one. My ignition's not actually on, it's just uh, at second position here. Connecting to vehicle. So here's an example of uh, the software key stuff. If you don't have your license yet, just ignore that. Don't get stuck into it. I've got a little bit of a little bit of a flashy twinkly light. Okay, so now this is open and it's connected to the car. Now, the first time you do this, if you don't get a connection, you'll get popped to this window. Here I have set up and I'm going to go to Vim Select. And if I haven't done this yet, I have to pick the, the vehicle interface. So, so I think this is vehicle interface manager. I think that's what Vim is. But you see, I've got Auto Kent VCI installed here uh, from the drivers I put on earlier. And I'm just using the 1.43 version of the driver. If you haven't done that before, make sure you've configured the correct interface because by default it uses this TIS text stream and you will get a myriad of error messages and you won't understand why. Make sure you've set up the interface, otherwise you will connect to nothing at all. Once that's configured, you get connected vehicle. It's probably point out though, this is slow. Like this is over 20 years old. It's using a very old protocol to connect to the car and communicate. Everything is slow. All right, so that's connected. I'm just gonna select my HDG10. It's a 2003 car, so I'll pick the year. And then I'll hit next. Okay, connects to the car. And then you can get into any of the settings. The one I use most often is uh, chassis AHC. <laughs> you can just double click on one of the yellow sections and it will pop open. No diagnostic codes, which is good, but if I hit data list, I can see all my sensor readings that are available. And there'll be like 20 readings that it can get, even with the ignition off. Um, so pressure's at zero because the thing's off, but um, plenty to be getting on with here. And it's the same for the engine. If I go back, I can do system select. Uh, even though I have HC open, it's on a tab at the top here, HC live. I can still go into the engine instead and it will then open up multiple tabs on the top so that I can review more than one thing at a time. So I do have an engine diagnostic code for my airflow meter circuit. That's intermittent, but I'll clear that and see if it comes back. Might be that my math is on its way out. I can clear that, simple as. And I've still got my HT connector open. I can switch back and forward. It just takes a bit of time to reload when I'm flicking back and forward between sensors. Um, so what was I doing? Engine, data list. It will probably read very little from the engine because the car's actually turned off. All right, so it's got some things, some temperatures from static, engine speed and RPM. I'll just turn the engine on. So now you can see it's starting to read my RPM timing, injection quantities and so on. So it's nowhere near as advanced as a modern system like you would get on an Audi or something like that. But there are still readings that you can use for basic diagnostics. Oh, because I've turned the engine off, that disconnects. So I'm going to go back to position two. And retry and I can connect. I don't have to reconfigure. Just as long as my power is on, I'll be able to reconnect to the car. There it is. Okay, so that's... Um that's about it. The one trick I found was this Vim select. That tripped me up for a long time because I hadn't configured the right Vim. It was on that default text stream thing. You have to configure it to use the driver that you have installed, which in my case is an AutoKent Mini VCI driver. Right, I'll pop back inside for final thoughts. So in summary, laptop with Windows 7 64-bit. If you can't install that on the laptop, run it in a virtual machine. Get yourself a 2534 cable, a mini VCI cable, you can get them on Amazon. I'll include some links below. Install the drivers, install TechStream, only run the patched version of TechStream so that it doesn't cripple the software. And you will have to go through a laborious process of doing Windows updates and installing .NET before you can actually run TechStream. Change the configuration on the cables so that TechStream attempts to run the correct cable driver and then connect to your car. Things not to do, do not trust this software to be virus free. Don't update the firmware or you will brick the cable and it won't work anymore. And don't update TechStream or you will disable the software and or any licensing workarounds or patches.
So hopefully this guidance helps you configure TechStream uh, for yourself or on your own laptop if you can get a hold of the right cable and if you can get through all the, the, the battle of driver installations and software patches and so on. Um, this is a, a way of doing this for the price of a £40 cable uh, rather than spending, you know, six, seven, eight hundred pounds on a, a TechStream device. Um, or one of the other ones there. I've seen some Android based tablets, like some of the top Dawn tablets. Um, I'll borrow one of them off Big Dave and I'll do a bit of review of what that can do. But because this is an older system, it's, it's less widely supported. And because I am not a Toyota dealership, that makes it hard also. It is possible to do TechStream at home, it is tricky. You will need a laptop and some ability. You'll have to be quite tech savvy in order to get it set up. But I do hope this guidance helps you uh, get it installed on your own uh, and try and cl clear up some of the sort of misinformation that's that's out and about there uh, on the internet. This is literally the cheapest VCI cable that I could get a hold of. And it came with a CD that included software, um, which helped me. I mean, I had it came with I had the drivers and I had TechStream anyway. Um, but the, the CD that came from China also included the software. So I installed that and it came with the patches and so on to, to uh, get around the licensing restrictions for the for the old sort of abandoned software. Um, I normally use TechStream version 14, version 16 and version 18 are also widely available. I've never needed anything more than version 14 for the, for the Land Cruiser. Okay, so I hope that was helpful. That's a lot of talking uh, and it's a very different style of video, but hopefully this is useful to the community uh, as a whole. Um, if it's helped you, please do let me know in the comments below. Uh, and if you've got any questions, just drop them in uh, and I'll try and answer them as best I can. I'm not an expert in TechStream. Um, my background is, you know, 25 years worth of working in IT, but I'm not a mechanic so I'm making that sort of stuff up as I go along. If this video has been helpful please do let me know. Um, keep watching, keep subscribing. Thanks everyone for all your positivity so far. It really makes a big difference. You know we were we um, we had a couple of other goes at YouTube channels like we have a channel called V Performance which has some 25,000 subscribers on it but it's a very negative environment. Very different style of videos um, but it's a very negative environment no matter what we make and no matter how much effort we put into it. Um, so there's a whole back catalogue on V Performance if you want to go and have a look at some of that stuff but I, I really enjoy everyone's uh, contributions and positivity that we see on these Land Cruiser videos so so with that I would say thank you for watching if you've made it all to the end you're clearly a loyal subscriber thank you very much uh, stay safe look after one another make good decisions if you can and I will see you in another video thanks everyone bye